episode of the campus comics cast uh we've got a few different topics to go over this time with you uh we're gonna start with uh, day two of the dc fandom event we're gonna be talking about some of the stuff we've been reading lately and we're gonna continue our look at batman the adventures continue uh this is dan brown and i'm joined this time by scott reed and mark Atchison. And just to re- you know, remind everyone, just kind of bear with us if there's any audio issues or any technical things going on. We are still recording this via the internet. We're not all in the same location anymore. We're still socially distancing. Uh, you know, we're spread apart and pretty decent distances right now. But the store is open, and we are located at 816 East Main Street, Suite B in Carbondale, Illinois. Uh, our phone number is... 618-457-6011 if you want to give us a call. But we are open our normal hours from Tuesday through Saturday, 11 to 6. So be sure to stop by and, you know, pick up your books or say hi or, you know, want to just check out what's new on the shelf. Uh, still have things kind of trickling in where, you know, it's not really back up to what it was before the shutdown and everything, but we are getting new books in. Uh, there's some good stuff coming out. Some of that we'll be talking about later. Uh, we just ask, you know, per, you know, the sort of mandates and everything that everyone wears a mask when they come in and tries to do their best with sh- social distancing in the store and that kind of thing, you know, just within reason. Uh, so I think we're going to start off talking about day two of the DC Fan Gnome event. Well, talking about the shop, I just right. reminded me that September 26th, oh, right, right, right. two weeks from yesterday, it's because we recorded this on the 13th, uh, Mike and the, I guess the record store, it's other. What's what's the name of the record store? Rest record store uh, days or something like that? Uh, record store day was the other day. Okay, but there's another uh, one for the 26th. Oh, okay. So maybe there's multiple this year because of there COVID. I don't know. Yeah. But so there's, there's, Plaza, Plaza Records will be hosting that then. Mm-hmm. So Mike's gonna have the shop open, and I believe I'm gonna be set up there again, and he's probably gonna have a couple of others um, come in. Some if the weather's nice, he can be set up out front. Maybe one or two more people inside the shop. So buying, selling, and trading uh, that day. So uh, if you missed it last time, it was a pretty good day for the store, and uh, it'd be great to have everybody show back up again on 26th. Yeah, well, I think we had a really, good, I think we had a good turnout. Everybody had a good time. So yeah, and again, you know, there's no conventions right now, so we're kind of doing what we can for everybody. Yep. You know, it's probably the closest you're going to get. And again, that's sort of the reason behind the DC Fandom event, where you know San Diego and all the big conventions got canceled this year. So DC kind of took it upon themselves to do sort of an online version. Uh, Again, there's been some different versions of that from different companies this year uh, with sort of varying degrees of success. I think the first day last month of the DC fandom, they said they had like 22 million people watching, you know, kind of participating. So I think that's, you know, pretty good results for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I watched, you know, I kind of got online and was kind of checking everything out this weekend, this past weekend. You eventually got connected I to there. eventually yeah. got to, because uh, first off, they were apparently promoting this new book called 502 Bad Gateways. Pretty hard, hard <laughs> heavy there at the beginning. Uh, just every page you click on, that's what the, you know, it was a little preview of that, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, it was kind of frustrating there. And the thing is, day one last month went so smoothly, you know, comparatively. Um, I didn't have like the first day I didn't have any issues until like the very end when they were, when they premiered the Batman trailer. Uh, but you know, all this stuff that was on this past weekend was supposed to be last month. So you would think they have, you know, a few extra weeks there to figure out what's going on and, you know, get their servers in a row, whatever they needed to do. But, you know, it was kind of frustrating there at the beginning. And I saw some other people on social media kind of having the same problem. So it wasn't just me. Uh, yeah. But I kinda, yeah, they may have had somebody, you know, maybe they because they had so much attention the first time, they may have had somebody out there just trying to, you know, DDoS them just to gain some attention for themselves. So who knows? 
but um, so I kind of poked around a little bit more though, and you know, so there are the different sections uh, that were all set up, and uh, Hall of Heroes was the one from last month, which was all the kind of big announcements and movie trailers, and that was sort of on a loop again, so you could watch that again if you missed it the first time, but. There was also the Watchverse, the Insiderverse, the U-verse, Funverse, and Kidsverse, all with sort of different uh, focuses on sort of different things within DC. Uh, so initially, Funverse, I could get to work, but that was about the only one where it was sort of like different games you could play and different sort of things. There was a comic reader that was set up that was working uh, where they had about, I think it was around 200 different comic books you could read for free. Uh, and again, most of it's stuff, you know, like Hush, Watchmen, uh, Dark, you know, Metal, different things like that. Sort of big kind of flagpole, you know, sort of books for DC. The cool thing was, though, they had the Return of Milestone book in there. So it was sort of the new, first new thing from sort of the Dakota universe in a while. And this is sort of a prelude to their relaunch in February. Uh, so you see, uh, I think it was Icon and Rocket in there and Static. And so sort of like rebooting them a little bit, new costumes for everybody, kind of new looks, which is understandable, you know, for something that launched, what was it like 94, 93, something like that back in the day? I don't remember. <laughs> so, yeah. So kind of updating everybody's look. But again, sort of a fun little thing that I didn't know was going to be there. It was kind of neat to check that out. Uh, and then in the fun verse, they had some other things, games you could play. Then there were uh, videos of like some of the rides at some of the, like the Six Flags and the different amusement parks. And I haven't been, I haven't been to an amusement park in about 20 years. And, you know, <laughs> that's how long it's been since I've been on a roller coaster. But they were showing uh, sort of a split screen of the actual ride. And then I guess it's, it must be video that accompanies the roller coaster. I'm not sure. But like Superman you know, flying through Metropolis or like the bat plane going through Gotham and stuff like that. So I'm not sure how that really works out in the park. Cause I, you know, I haven't been on any of these rides, but it was, you know, can't really get out right now that much. You're certainly not going to amusement park if you're smart, you know what I mean? So, uh, kind of a neat way to sort of, sort of experience that. Uh, uh milestone was 1993. Okay. So yeah. Uh, and then sort of the, uh, initially the sort of, Things that would take you off site were all working. Like there was some Lego stuff you could check out for kids and different things like that. So all those kind of links were working initially. Uh, it took me, it seemed like it was about an hour into the event before I could check out everything else. But then that seemed to go pretty smooth after that. Uh, there was a Joker War panel with uh, James Tynan and talking about uh, Clown Hunter and some of these other new characters, and he specifically said these characters are here to stay. You know, he thinks these will be long-lasting characters in the Batman universe. We'll see. You know, I think we've kind of speculated on that, you know, before on here. Uh, trying to see what else. There was a... No, oh, there was also a... a mo it was called the Mostly Deceased panel, where uh, he had Tom Taylor and some of the creators from the Deceased books on there talking about the different series they've done. And mentioning that in the, uh, I believe it's the Hope at World's End, the digital version, there's going to be an upcoming chapter dealing with the super pets. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. Uh, he did mention, though, that this, you know, the book is titled Hope at World's End. So there, you know, there will be hopefully not just a really downer ending to that book. We'll see. Uh, there was also random, like, sort of cosplay videos, you know, of cosplayers and stuff like that again. Cosplay is a big part of conventions anymore. Uh, so sort of a different way to experience that in here. Uh, I checked out the Man of Tomorrow panel. It's the new uh, Superman animated feature they've got out now. Uh, it's sort of the sort of Tuckerverse version of the uh, DVD features is over. It's sort of like their new 52 sort of style one is done. And so Man of Tomorrow is its own thing. Uh, sort of a Superman origin. They said it specifically wasn't an origin, sort of like early days, maybe more like Superman year one sort of thing. Uh, I watched it, though. It was good. I was, you know, happy with it. Um, the director kept mentioning that they were didn't want so much big budgets. They were seeing it more as like an indie film, 
trying to tell like a smaller story with Superman, not trying to be so bombastic with it. Uh, and sort of addressing uh, the Tuckerverse films, saying they wanted a different look. They wanted a thicker, more variable line weight in the drawings. And I mean, that's sort of a technical thing for artists, but, you know, it's something people can see where you've got sort of a thicker outline around the characters and that kind of thing. Whereas more of the Tucker was more of an anime kind of style where you have pretty much the same line weight, you know, drawing on all the characters and that sort of thing. Um I didn't realize the parasite and this was pro played by Brett Dalton of uh, agents of shield. So he was on there talking and I just, I don't know. I watched, it, I just didn't recognize his voice, I guess. And mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking of him in there. Uh, but then Lobo is also one of the villains in the story. And they brought up how he's a good counterpoint to Superman and something I hadn't thought of. And I've, you know, I like stories where Superman and Lobo fight. I think Lobo does work well as a good Superman villain. But so something they brought up is that it's almost like Lobo is the man of yesterday in this context, where he's very kind of boorish and misogynistic kind of character, you know, where Superman is supposed to be the man of tomorrow. So sort of a neat thing I hadn't thought of. And then they listed uh, what they've got coming out in 2021 as far as the DVD cartoon features. And I think some of these have been announced uh, but they said in the first one of next year will be a Bruce Tim produced Batman Soul of the Dragon. And I think I've heard that title before, but I don't really know what that's about. I, you know, it's, I'm pretty sure it's just an original story. Uh, we'll see what that is. And then what I was excited to hear is a Justice Society World War II feature, hmm. which I don't think I, I had heard announced, but maybe it has been. I just missed it. But uh, and then there will be the last two of 2021 will be two part Batman, the long Halloween adaptation. So, again, I think, you know, a pretty longer story, uh, a lot of mystery. You got an opportunity for a really good cliffhanger there in between parts, in between the releases. And like they've done with Dark Knight Returns and Death of Superman, I'm sure eventually they'll double dip. And just make a complete, you know, longer version of the whole thing when they're done. So it should be a good time. Um, when, you know, so as this event's going on, I was kind of jumping around to the different sections and trying to see what all they had on there. Again, like a convention where you're running around to different rooms, checking out different things. Uh, there was a video uh, draw along with Jim Lee and family. And so that was Jim Lee, uh, like with his kids, watching a video of Jim Lee teaching you how to draw. <laughs> and uh, I had a lot of art classes in school and stuff. I never heard so many references to boogers and drawing the nose, but I wish I had now. Uh, but it was fun, too, seeing Jim Lee's kids watching a pretty serious video of him, you know, instructing you how to draw and then just sort of taking the pretension out of it, you know, with the kids viewpoint of what's going on. Uh, but it was a fun time. And then seeing the kids drawings was kind of neat, you know, their interpretations of a Jim Lee drawing. Uh, they also had a fan art gallery on there where you could, that you could check out and just kind of click through. I think that might still be up. Some of these features are still up and I've noticed that some of the uh, videos have made it to DC's YouTube channels and things like that. So you can still check out some of this stuff online. Um, but then I noticed a lot of the, uh, there was a lot of videos that I believe were like DVD special features and stuff like that over the years. So I tried to skip over some of that stuff. I pretty much just wanted to see exclusive stuff because this was a limited event. Uh, it only ran for 24 hours and I believe they said there's over a hundred hours of content. So you can't get through everything in a day. So I was trying to pick a little wisely what I was looking at here. Uh, oh, there was a fun video called uh, To the Batmobile, which showed different fans uh, homemade versions of the Batmobile. And this is like actual cars, you know, that you can drive and things like that. So there was sort of a almost beetle looking sort of, uh, not sure how to describe it, sort of four wheeler looking version of the 40s Batmobile with the big face on the front, and the one fin. And sort of the black trend that was pretty mean looking, but looked pretty neat. And then sort of a street legal version of the 89 Batmobile, this one guy had made and different things like that. So just kind of fun seeing, you know, how different people have made their own Batmobiles in real life. Uh, there were several videos of uh, Jim Lee just sort of answering fans questions, 
And yeah, Jim Lee, like the first day was all over this event. Again, if this were last year, it'd, it'd just be Dan DeDio all over the place. But since he's no longer with the company, all this kind of falls on Jim Lee. Uh, one thing I want to point out was someone asked about what are the odds of like a live action version of Punchline. And he wasn't, you know, making any claims or anything, but he basically said he assumed we would see that sooner than later. You know, I guess just how they, you know, view the popularity of this character or what their plans are. And again, he wasn't hinting at, hey, she's in Suicide Squad or anything like that, but just saying what their kind of expectations are for that character. Uh, there was sort of a fun game on there called the Joker's Escape Room that I checked out. It was basically just a point and click uh, sort of thing. But then, you know, it was through this sort of uh, Joker themed warehouse where you had to go through and defuse bombs. And there was one uh, game where you have to actually turn on your microphone on the computer and you have to match the Joker's laugh and it scores you and things like that. <laughs> uh, there was a DC trivia quiz uh, that wasn't very long. I kind of expected something a little more intense for this. Uh, oh, there was a uh, some sort of feature where you can customize your own Chevy Trailblazer. Just what every <laughs> DC fan wants to do. And, and you uh, see it also uh, frequently in the DC universe. Yes, exactly. And I, I did it. I posed it. You can check them out on my Twitter. I threw a couple up there that I did. <laughs> they just had these sort of stock designs you could throw on and different things. Oh, one of the fun things, and I saw this right before the event launch, was uh, there was a commercial for Big Belly Burger. So <laughs> the sort of fictitious restaurant from the DC comics and TV shows, and it's sort of a let's go to the lobby style commercial for a Big Belly Burger. And hopefully that's on YouTube or somewhere, because that was a lot. That was really neat, and it looks like they actually spent some time on that. That didn't look like it was just slapped together. Uh, there was a panel for the upcoming CW show Superman and Lois uh, with the creator and, you know, the stars of that show. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to hear the spoilers or not, but one of the big announcements was that with that is that they said they will have two teenage sons on the show. Uh, I think they were saying, I believe it was around Crisis, they showed that they had a son named Jonathan. Apparently, after the events of Crisis, there are two sons now. And I don't know how they're speeding up their age or how that works out or if that was just all part of crisis. But they'll both be uh, teenagers, teenagers when the show starts. Uh, oh, uh, on the comic reader, in addition to the return of Milestone, they also had a few uh, older Milestone issues. Like there was a – basically it looks like the first trade's worth of Icon was on there to read and some issues of hardware and some of the other Milestone books from back in the day. One of the weird things I noticed just in general with the comic reader was there were some books that was like the second and third issues of different books, but not the first. <laughs> Seems like a weird choice to you're trying to introduce people to things. I'm not sure what the thinking was with that. Um, oh, there's a group um, called the Creative Coalition uh, that sort of raises awareness about the arts and things like that. And they put together um, some recreations of Superman radio shows from the 40s of the adventures of Superman radio show. And they had a lot of different actors in there. Uh, Tim Daly was in there reprising his role as Superman. Uh, but pretty much every radio show episode was a new cast and narrators and everything. Uh, they had some good actors on there. Um, Alfred Woodard from uh, Luke Cage was on there. Uh, CCH Pounder, Giancarlo Esposito from uh, Better Call Saul and Mandalorian played Jor-El in the first part uh, and hearing, you know, it's a radio show, but you know, they were filming, you know, in their houses. And so seeing Giancarlo with his quarantine hair going on about the impending destruction of Krypton really added another layer to that performance. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that, that was fun. I, I don't know. I assume that those are only available at the DC fandom event. Hopefully those turn up somewhere else. Cause they were just kind of a fun thing to check out. Uh, there was a good video with uh, Ken Lashley talking about his art and sort of the importance, you know, of uh, people of color in comics and things like that. Oh, there was a good video um, of uh, different photographers who do unit still photography on some of the DC projects and things. And again, that's something you never really hear about, but you see their work all the time. 
So these are photographers who are on the movie and TV sets who take photos that you know are used for marketing and sort of promotion of the different uh, films and you know live action efforts. And it's it's just neat seeing that. And there were some examples they had in a, another section of the Fandom event. But it's just sort of neat kind of hearing their stories and sort of the importance of what they do. And, you know, they're like they have to work around the movie crew and the actors and everything. But they still manage to get these really striking and really nice photographs that, you know, are used for marketing. And they're used for references on the sets and, you know, sort of continuity and things like that while they're making these films. Uh, there was a section called, um, what was it? I think it was Funky Flashman's Gallery. Yeah, Funky Flashman's Art Gallery uh, that you could check out had a lot of production art and sort of concept art. And there was some of this unit still photography in there that was really nice. The cool thing about that was, though, they would have different props and things. But then they also had uh, concept art from like Superman Lives and Justice League Mortal, which were movies that were never produced. So it's kind of the only way you can see some of these um, designs. And there for Justice League Mortal in particular, there was a lot of. Looks like they did a lot of tests on different S's for Superman's suit. And so you saw a lot of, you know, and this is 3D sculpted pieces that they had. And some were like more three-dimensional, some were flatter. Just sort of some of these experimentations they were doing with kind of what the look they wanted for the suit and that sort of thing. And again, that movie never got made. So, and I know there was someone was supposed to be working on a documentary of that. I don't know if it ever happened or not. But just sort of neat seeing, you know, what could have been. It was a documentary, documentary on the Superman Lives. Lives. Yeah. And someone was supposed to be doing one about Justice League Mortal too, but I don't know if that ever happened. Uh, there was a neat sort of short video with Greg Sipes, who is the voice of Beast Boy on Teen Titans Go. Uh, he was also Michelangelo on the Ninja Turtles cartoon from like 2012. Uh, kind of going into his history and how he got into voice acting and things. Talking about how he grew up uh, on Jerky Boys tapes and CDs. <laughs> And then would mess around on his father's CB, messing with truck drivers and things growing up. Uh, there was also a similar one with uh, Kevin Conroy on there talking. Uh, and he said that if he has advice for anyone wanting to play Batman, his he said his advice is don't. I'm still here. <laughs> so sort of a nice tongue-in-cheek thing from him. Uh, yeah. And there were, you know, different, um, again, trying to keep with sort of the global aspect of all this. There was a lot of different panels of fans from around the world there was a pretty good one about fans from the middle east that i watch had uh you know people in kuwait and saudi arabia and things like that one guy owns a big comic shop out there and then some are just fans of all this and collectors and things like that uh there was a really good uh, one of fans from japan but it was like an hour and a half and i couldn't even watch all of it because it's like some of these panels are only a half hour so it's like watching all that that's three others i can't watch you know, so I watched for probably the first half hour of that. But again, then there were ones of like fans from Italy and sort of different countries like that. So just people from all around the world into DC stuff. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. Um, today on the DC Universe uh, Instagram, I noticed a post said, uh, we hope everyone enjoyed DC Fandom. Stay tuned next week for exciting news about DC Universe and our future. <laughs> so it sounds like the other shoe's about to drop on DC Universe. Uh, again, I don't think there was really anything. They didn't really utilize the DC Universe app in any of this either day. Uh, I think that's pretty telling, you know, as far as where the app is going with that. So looks like this week we're going to get some news about that or how, you know, how that's going to play out. Yeah, they quote they unquote announced. Now. That Doom yeah, Patrol season, season three, three was on HBO, HBO Max. Max. Yeah, yeah. They've they've said Jim Lee has said that like all the shows are going to HBO Max. So uh, I think. Oh, the other thing they had was um, a lot of the panels they had from last month were also available on here, but a few of them had extended versions. I didn't check any of those out because I watched them before. I don't need to see five more minutes necessarily, but apparently on the Titans one, they did announce Donna Troy will be back for the third season, which is kind of a surprise considering how the second season ended. Uh, but we'll see where that goes. And I think that was about it. That's kind of all the sort of bigger highlights, I think, that I had on there. 
Uh, and again, Bleeding Cool has posted a few things too of like other news coming out. And again, I'm I'm sure I missed a lot of stuff because again, there was a lot on there. There's only a day to kind of go through it all and kind of sift through and check out what you want. So, was the Calm King announcement about Batman and Catwoman part of fandom? I don't think so. I think that was just part of the solicits. That's okay. the other thing. I think people were expecting a lot more news to come out of this fandom, mm-hmm. but all this stuff was made last month. It's like there's not going to be anything that we really haven't heard before, that, you know, unless they just kept it super quiet for a month, which, you know, is rare. Yeah, there's a lot on the DC CW verse. Yeah. So I think that was about it for that. Did you guys have anything else you wanted to bring up about that or anything you might have heard? Did you do the did you see the panel where Tom King was talking about Rorschach? Oh yeah, I did I did watch that. There was the sort of expanding watchman mm-hmm. uh, panel they did with him and the artist for Rorschach and talking about that. I thought it was interesting that they talked about how um I guess Ann uh, Ann Rand Hein Rand had a contemporary and I wasn't familiar with this individual. And they said they're basically uh, putting Rorschach's philosophy um, in along with this other individual, as opposed uh, where uh, Steve Ditko would have been an Ayn Rand person, having been the creator of the question in Mr. A, who Rorschach is basically this mishmash of. Um, so Tom King did say he was trying to, you know, keep the philosophy of the character um, and res- I guess maybe they were trying to respect Ditko, but they, they he basically said Ditko would not have liked this interpretation of this character. <laughs> he might like the art, but he wouldn't have liked the the character. So. No, he did he did come out and say that Ditko would hate it. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, and that's really no surprise. I mean, he's yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he was a fan of a lot of mainstream comic books in the later years there. So no. Um, okay, I had not seen anything about what's what's going on with this Penny's Worth. Um, was that the, something? The Pennyworth TV show. Yeah, uh, I saw the first couple episodes. It's good, uh, but you have to have. I think it's Epics is that it's on. It's so weird oh, too because there's a show about Alfred going on, and he's dead in the book, books. Mm-hmm. Even though he keeps popping up in Batman. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's very little promotion for that. There was a panel for that there. I just didn't get around to it. And again, I've always seen. What I saw was really good. I want to watch the rest of it. I just don't want to subscribe to Epics necessarily. I guess I completely missed there was a season of that because they're here. They're talking about the second season. I'm like, I've not even heard of this show or if I've heard of it, I've forgotten it. Yeah, it came out a while back. And like what I saw was good. I want to watch it. But part of the reason I blew off the panel was because I haven't seen all the first season. I didn't want to hear any spoilers because I'm sure (laughs) there are. Yeah. Uh, But yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's more of a British crime show than it is a superhero show. You know, it's vaguely the 60s i suppose i don't know if they give it a specific year or not i can't remember but it's you know a young alfred pennyworth running into thomas wayne and that kind of thing back in the day sort of how they met and again yeah, he was um, he was a member of mi13 right wasn't that the uh the idea uh the British right. intelligence yeah so but, uh, yeah, again, I just haven't seen that much of the show to really go into it too much. It seems like there was one other thing I wanted to mention, but I'm scrolling through the list and I'm just not seeing it. Oh, um, Young Justice. So they have they say anything about the se- they have here? Um, they're going yeah, to be season four. season four. I'm not sure where that was announced, though. I didn't come across that anywhere. Like, I didn't see a Young Justice panel necessarily or anything. So I did. Yeah, I did see that online, though. But, uh, yeah, I'm not sure where that announcement was made, actually. Okay. So, yeah, again, part, part of the limited nature of only having it set for 24 hours. Because, yeah. you know, even, even a bigger con is three or four days anymore. You know what I mean? You'd have time mm-hmm. to kind of check everything out. So, yeah, uh, I kind of hope. But, again, speaking of that, I kind of hope some of this stuff turns up on DC's YouTube channels or somewhere. Maybe throw some of this stuff on HBO Max if you want, you know, or mm. something like that. But, you know, it, w- it would be nice if there was a way to kind of see more of this stuff. Um, again, it is supposed to be more like a comic convention. So maybe just the, you know, timely nature of it's part of the experience. But, yeah. 
but again, I, uh, I think it was a good time. Uh, I can't imagine they don't do something like this again, considering how successful the first day was, at least. Uh, I haven't heard anything, you know, as we're recording this, this just wrapped a few hours ago. So I haven't really heard how successful day two was. Or if the initial, you know, glitches causing <laughs> other problems for people, or maybe people dropped out quicker. Yeah, they were blaming it on the Riddler, is what I think I saw on their Twitter oh, feed. Yeah, that's that's what happened. The fictitious character. Yes. Your servers. <laughs> you would think AT and T would have enough money to get their uh, internet convention running. <laughs> It's assuming they want to invest it. Oh, the other the other announcement that uh, was in one of the Jim Lee videos apparently was that 5G is dead. He was saying, um, again, we were getting early solicits on uh, some other things too, and it looks like they're reformatting some different things. They've already said, you know, we're getting the John Ridley Batman book. Mm-hmm. Now it looks like Dan Jurgens is taking some of the other uh, generation stuff and turning it into a like a standalone miniseries. It sounds like. Uh, so it sounds like, you know, officially the thing that was never announced is dead, <laughs> you know, sort of thing. And, you know, what's surprising, too, you know, they pulped those free comic book day uh, Generation Zero specials. And I haven't seen any of those online. Have you guys heard anything about any of those leaking or anything like that? I no. have not. There's usually a few of those books will turn up online when that happens. But that doesn't seem to be the case for this one anyway. They must have never. The only way they can really control that is if they never got them shipped to begin with. Yeah, they must. They must not have. And since and since distribution was down, you know, that probably. I didn't. see. Uh, I see. Years from now, someone publishing a uh, canceled comics cavalcade version of all this five G stuff. Yeah. I wanted to reprint that old original one. Oh man, that would be great. Yeah. Even though some of those books are starting to turn up now in collections and things, like that last issue of Joker. Things like yeah. that. What collection was that in, Dan? That was the uh, 70s Joker standalone book they did. Okay. And they came out with a hardcover of that, I think it was last year. And so they put that unpublished last issue in there. Yeah. That and it, smart. It, it was on DC Universe where you could read it, and it, it ends in a cliffhanger, so I'm kind of glad it didn't get published for real yeah. back in the day, but, you know, that's yeah. how it goes. Yeah, so we want to talk about some of the stuff we've been reading lately, or? Sure, sounds good. Mike, what have you been reading? Oh, my gosh. Well, old comics, new comics, middle-of-the-road comics. Um I guess the middle of the road stuff is uh, me still trying to make up for me not fully reading uh, Saga Volume 1 for our review. <laughs> I'm on uh, Volume 3 now, so uh, still liking it. Um, and uh, I'm not, you know, new new comic stuff, there's, there, there's a lot of new stuff. I'm just trying to get caught up, but uh, the stuff that stands out is um, Batman 3 Jokers, and I don't really want to get into spoiler spoilery type stuff just because there's a lot of people that haven't read it um but it is good it's um it's getting good reviews it's very intriguing uh the art is fantastic by jason fabach uh this is a a jeff johns conception that goes way back to you know i i want to say uh in the justice league 40 something um i think it was issue 50 was it 50 yeah. where Batman was sitting in the Mobius chair and it's, you know, the Mobius chair is all knowing and tells the person sitting in it, everything they want to know. And he, he finds out that there's three jokers and, and this story is the long, I mean, that goes back to like 2015, 2016, even before rebirth. So we've been waiting a while and uh, I, I have to say, I'm not disappointed so far. I know Tyler is, was, couldn't, couldn't wait for me to read it so we could talk about it. But I, I think this is, might even be a book that we would, after everybody's read it, maybe we talk about it more in depth. It, it's pretty, it's pretty good. Um, and it's just after reading the first uh, of the three prestige format uh, issues that I say that. Uh, the other new comics that I'm reading, I got caught up on Strange Adventures, and um, which is up to issue four, 
And this pretty much makes up for all of my, all of my disdain for heroes in crisis. Um, and, and even my, I, you know, my, my, I, I mean, I really like Mr. Miracle until it wrapped up, but hopefully this doesn't disappoint, but so far it's, it's even better than Mr. Miracle. So I highly recommend strange adventures. Um, and then as far as old comics go, um, I'm reading a, uh, uh, the uncanny X-Men number 245. I haven't actually, uh, I've got it out of the bag and board, but I'm, it's uh, I got it because it's uh, a parody of the DC invasion from the early nineties. And I always like those uh, unofficial crossovers between the two big companies. And it's uh, supposedly got a Perry White, Jimmy Olsen and Clark Kent appearance. So uh, I plan on reading that actually tonight. And then lastly, I uh, I've always been a fan of the, the idea of the secret um, origins. Um, and there you probably have heard of the, DC had a um, a series. It was an anthology anthology series that was really one issue had nothing to do with the other. Um, it was called DC Special Series, and it 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 was comprised of dollar comic <laughs> size uh, books. Um, had treasure editions, had even digest size. But this one is a forty eight page. I think it's forty eight pages. Uh, it's a secret origins of superheroes that features the uh, origins of Dr. Fate, Light Ray and Black Canary. And um, it's got one of the one of my favorite covers because I always I've always been a collector of those covers where covers where someone's bursting through like one of those paper hoops, uh, you know, like, you know, Detective 30, what was the first 38. Yeah, there's been a lot of um, mimic that um, has been mimicked many times, but. Um, this is not really a paper hoop. It's basically Dr. Fate conjuring up basically like a boom tube type thing where light ray bursts through it. And, uh, all three issues are, are good or all three stories are good. Um, you know, a couple of them are written by Jerry Conway. Um, one of them is written by, I want to say Paul Evitz. Um, and that's about it for me. Well, I've been uh, focusing on reading the Chip Zdarsky run of Daredevil, so um, I can't remember if I finished the Charles Soule run of that book or not, but um, I just I, I started reading Zdarsky. I'm up to about issue 20 on that. Um, the, the general plot line for like the first 20 issues is that uh, Daredevil accidentally kills somebody, and he's having to kind of live with the ramifications – um, of that um, and he comes in contact with a lot of other people that are um, related to and or know uh, this this individual that he accidentally killed um, and it's just it's pretty good it's, it kind of harkens back to the Bendis Brubaker run of Daredevil where there would sometimes be you know m multiple issues where you would not see Daredevil in costume it was just focusing on Matt Murdock so um, this, uh, story this story arc is focusing in again on 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 matt so um so that's kind of that's kind of interesting echo in that storyline yeah there must be <laughs> <laughs> i'm not sure where that echo is coming from so um not that echo just some sound <laughs> echo so but electra's in this storyline oh, yeah. so yeah and luke cage and spider-man show up briefly and they basically all tell daredevil he needs to quit so hmm. um so it's pretty good like i said I'm, I'm not finished with that um i think sadarsky still is on daredevil at the current time um, so I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm maybe, I don't know, two thirds of the way through his current story arc. Um, then after the last, um, sale at uh, campus comics, I picked up the, his, the rocketeer and Betty statue that he had. So since I did that, I felt the need to reread that, um, first rocketeer story. So I reread the, that first five part rocketeer story, uh, going back to star slayer two on through Pacific presents. Um, uh, so read that. Um, good to see some Dave Stevens artwork again. And beyond that, I've been kind of catching up on Captain America and Immortal Hulk, which are both still uh, really solid books. And I've got probably next on my read list uh, since we're coming, getting ready to come in November, you know, not too far off, just a few weeks. Uh, I've got V for Vendetta in my in my list to read uh, really, really soon. So 
I need to so, find that. I need to find a collection of that. I don't know if it's ever been collected, but I just I mailed. Yes. I gave that entire run to my nephew. Well, um, Mike has a copy at the store that includes the Guy Fox mast. So there you go. I'll be there next Saturday or the 26th, so I'll get it then maybe. Yeah. yeah so, okay. and and it's probably something he could still order for you. So just FYI. So yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, and we got a we got a new poster in for it too, so you can pick that up while you're there. <laughs> I actually a woman I work with out in Utah. Um, she her maiden name is uh, what is the last name of the um, Fox? F A W K E S. Yeah, well, that's yes. the that's, that's the, the original guy. guy. That's yeah. the uh, that's the historical figure, right? Um, her her family name or her maiden name is Fox, and According to her, uh, that's her ancestor. So um, she's she's not been one to make anything up. But I'm I'm I, I she does I know she's got a brother or uncle or someone who does a lot of geneal genealogy. So those historical figures are usually pretty easy to get the uh, lineage from. So um, that was pretty interesting. Oh, well, uh, I've been reading. Uh, Actually, I just got the first issue came out of uh, Bill and Ted are doomed. And so this is a prequel to the uh, new movie that just came out. Uh, and it's written by Evan Dorkin, who did the Bill and Ted comics for Marvel back in the day. And it's drawn by Roger Langridge of uh, Fred the Clown and Popeye and Muppets. And yeah, I, I think I brought this up on when it was originally solicited. But yeah, anything with those two guys, I'm totally in the bag for. Uh, I think these are the two funniest cartoonists working right now. Having them on the same book, I think, is just amazing. And I'd be happy any combination. If they swapped it out where Langridge was writing and Dor Dorkin was drawing, I'd be down for it either way. Um, it's just I'd never thought we'd get a book with these guys working together. And, again, I like you know the new movie, and this is just sort of setting up some stuff from that, and it's been really good. Uh, I've been picking up the new Green Hornet book from Dynamite. It's uh, written by Scott Lobdell and drawn by, um, let's see here, it is, I'm going to mispronounce his name, but it's Anthony Marquez, I believe, and then Jay Bone is doing the inks on it, and it's been a sort of a cool kind of one color green look to the artwork so far. Uh, I'm not really sure where they're going with the story, but I like Green Hornet enough that I'll stick with it for at least this first story arc and see where they're going with it. Uh, we've got a new uh, Orville two-parter from Dark Horse. Uh, I really like the TV show, and I don't know where they're at with that third season. It should have been premiering around December, I think. I don't know if that's still happening or what the status of the show is. I know it was supposed to be moving to Hulu. Uh, but again, it's you know the comics have been, been just about as good as the show. Uh, so something to kind of tide you over till the show comes back. Again, I think I brought it up last time, but Firepower still been really good. We got another issue of that. Um, Bill, uh, has, that Bill, has the collection of Firepower been out or been solicited yet? I thought I've seen that. In, uh, I'm not sure. I don't remember it. I, Maybe I, I, the I actual don't, issues. Yeah. The graphic novel is out, of course, the sort of prelude. Yeah. Right. Not talked about it on the podcast. Um, but again, like, what is the issue? Issue three just came out a couple weeks ago, uh, so it's still probably be a couple months off. Right. Um, reading the back matter in here, though, the sort of commentary with Kirkman and Somni, uh, it sounds like they've got quite a few issues done because uh, uh, they're referencing things that happened in, like, issue nine maybe in here and saying that that was a while ago. So it sounds like this had, they've been working on this for a while, it sounds like, probably what they like what Kirkman did with the Oblivion song. So it sounds like they've probably got several of these in the can already. Uh, so hopefully it sells well enough. <laughs> it doesn't sound like they've already got their investment in it. Sure. Uh, again, I've been reading Billionaire Island from Ahoy. Uh, been a really good book. I think issue five came out. I think six is the last of that. It's been a kind of fun, satirical book to read. Um as far as older stuff, I've been reading the um, Flash Season Zero. Uh, it's a, a tie-in to the Grant Gustin Flash show. Um, it's been pretty good. Uh, Phil Hester did some of them. And uh, another artist I like, Ibrahim Mustafa, was on there. 
Uh, it's obvious, though, that they didn't have likeness rights to any of the actors. Uh, just sort of, you know, not, I want to say generic, not as a bad way, but not identifiable as the actors kind of way. Uh, probably just a contractual thing on their end. But, you know, been a pretty good book. And again, you know, we're not getting into CW shows back till next year. And they should, you know, we're getting to the point now where they should be starting up again pretty soon. But again, just sort of something to tide you over till everything kind of goes back to normal and starts coming out again. Uh, I think that's it for me. I haven't been reading on a ton right now. Oh, uh, I haven't been reading, but I've been playing the new Avengers game, too. That's been pretty good. I know we usually don't get into video games on here, but, you know close enough and you do there are different uh, sort of easter egg things where you can collect comic books in here so there's that uh they have a single player mode or is it online multiplayer only it's it's a uh, it's both there's a single player in the campaign and then there's an online version of it too i haven't checked out the online i haven't had a lot of time to get into it very far i'm just sort of barely getting through the single player campaign right now but some cool uh designs of the characters and things like that there's a sort of a fun scene where you go track down Tony Stark, who's living in this wrecked mansion and he has to hurry up and assemble an Iron Man armor out of things around the house real quick. Uh, so really sort of a bare bones sort of Iron Man suit that he throws together in the middle of this kind of fight scene. So it's pretty fun. Uh, and there's really cool designs of the characters. And of course there's all these uh, outfits you can download and apply to your character but it feels like suit changes and things are also sort of story points throughout. So it's like, I kind of don't want to change the look of the characters just yet because I feel like, you know, mm -hmm. that's going to happen. And this model is sort of the POV character for the game. And so she starts with sort of a homemade superhero outfit kind of thing. So I'm sure that'll be another part further in the game where she gets more of like her traditional outfit and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So... A lot of stuff to download, a lot of things to spend money on because it's a video game, you know, and that's all you get for. But it's, it's kind of nice having a Marvel console game again, too, as opposed to just all this mobile stuff they've been doing the last few years. I'm running into a kind of a weird thing, though, with this, where it's like I've played a Hulk game, I've played a Thor game, I've played Captain America games. Having them all together is sort of interesting, though, because when I'm playing as the Hulk, I've got sort of the sense memory of the Hulk standalone games. You can just wreck everything. <laughs> Can't do that in this game, but I want to because I'm playing as the Hulk, right. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. So, and again, that's not a fair criticism of this game. That's not what it is. It's not what they, you know, advertised it as, but just certain expectations you have from playing these games in the past and things like that. But now, you know, they've kind of combined all that. So... You guys been reading anything else good or that was the most of it other than what we'd read last what we talked about the last few episodes so i just i'm getting ready to start um it's not a comic book it's a it's a, a the unabridged jack london and oh, yeah. um a friend of mine gave it to me because he knew i uh i like uh, i liked his works so uh, I, I haven't read everything i've just read a couple of the big ones you know white fang and Call of the Wild, but um, I'm looking forward. It's been a long time since I've just picked up a novel and or a series of novels and read them. So yeah, I've I've been feeling that way lately too. Just want to get back into reading a novel. I just haven't had the time. Yeah, and I'm looking at ten long boxes here of comics I haven't read yet too. Is the other part of that? Almost feel <laughs> obligated to read that stuff when I do have time. You know, it's a heavy cross to bear, Dan. It is. It is nerd world problems for sure. <laughs> uh, well speaking of reading do we want to jump back into batman the adventures continue sounds like That's a plan thing. yeah so it's oh i guess i should double check before we're recording but we're looking at chapters 11 and 12 right that is correct and okay. mike's hand on 11 and i've got 12 all right and so then, then right. this will will end up being the sixth issue of the uh printed mini series that we're looking at the digital version on comic comiXology right now. All right. I'm ready if you guys are. Sounds good. All right. Uh, this is Batman. The adventures continue chapter 11. Batman and Robin are running 
toward the reader on the cover uh, with the Gotham skyline in the background. Uh, it's a pretty good looking cover. I don't know. It doesn't really give any credits. I'm assuming it's Ty Templeton, but it could be someone else. They have switched up cover artists a few times. Few times. Uh, the name of the story well, is what's that, Dan? Well, on the credits page here, they do list Carrie Randolph and Amelia Lopez as the uh, artists oh. on that. So they pretty much had a different cover artist for every you know physical issue of this book. So okay, I must have missed that, but it, it they're definitely keeping with the theme. They, it's hard to distinguish one of the artists from another on the covers, at least. Um, we're continuing the story of Red Sun Rising. This is part three, and it's uh, once again written by Alan Burnett and Paul Dini, and penciled by Ty Templeton and inked by Mark Morales. Uh, in the opening scene, Batman approaches a Gotham medical clinic where a girl is being treated by Dr. Tompkins, and that's Dr. Leslie Tompkins. Uh, Batman comes up on uh, Dr. Leslie Tompkins' medical clinic where a girl's being treated um, uh, for some injury. I'm not sure what it was, but she appears to be startled at the needle for the impending tetanus shot. But it's really the fact that Batman is standing behind Dr. Tompkins. Uh, this little girl assures Dr. Tompkins that she's not afraid of uh, Batman because that's Batman and he never hurts a kid. Um, Dr. Tompkins finishes treating her and uh, she leaves excited that she has met Batman. And I I kind of wondered by looking that there's no parents around. So I guess, uh, you know, it's Gotham and eight year old or so kids can just wander out of the doctor's office on their own. I'm not sure. Uh, Dr. Tompkins begins to chastise Batman for showing up at her clinic because it's no longer his personal emergency room. Uh, before she could finish, Batman tells her that Jason is alive, much to her shock. Uh, he runs down the events of the last few days to her and thought Jason maybe had come to see her because he had always liked her, um, but he had not been there. Uh, we go to a brief flashback with Leslie treating Jason for injuries and lecturing him that he acts like he's invincible. Uh, in fact, uh, she comments that uh, he incurred injuries in two weeks that it took his predecessor, Dick Grayson, two years to incur. Um, we, we return to the real-time tongue lashing that she's giving Batman for letting Jason run out, run wild. And Batman, he, he agrees. He says uh, he was supposed to take Jason off the streets for good, but before he could, Jason ran off. And um, Dr. Tompkins rather than then rather says something pretty shocking. She bluntly suggests that maybe it's time for the Batman persona to be laid to rest. Uh, we then switch to Alfred giving the story uh, of Jason, the backstory of Jason to Tim again back in the Batcave. And this pretty much takes up the entire rest of the story. Um, before I get into that, do you guys have any comments? I don't have any yet. I don't know. Am I allowed to talk? Yes. <laughs> uh, I just thought it was interesting. Uh, and we've, you know, we've had this before with this series where Leslie Tompkins appeared on Batman, the animated series, but did not appear on the new Batman adventures. Uh, so she didn't get the same redesign that everybody else got when the show was brought back on kids WB. Um, so we are seeing the original animated series version of her here with some of the, uh, sort of later designs like for Batman and things like that. Uh, and, you know, and then throwing in this new sort of Jason Todd design here. And again, that's just sort of a real got to be paying attention to notice that kind of thing. You know, I have to be really sort of in tune with the designs of these cartoons and things like that to pick up on that. But it's just interesting. And again, we'll see a little bit of that later on, too, with this with some of the flashback stuff in this uh, sequence with Alfred and Tim talking. And on a similar note, it's it's not about the animated version of her, but it's um, it got me wondering when her, when she first appeared. I do remember reading about her in the in the 70s and 80s. And uh, it turns out she was created by Denny O'Neill back in um, Detective Comics 457 in March of 1976. And she was based on a um, Catholic pacifist named Dorothy Day. And then eventually she evolved into being um, her. She was a friend of Thomas Wayne. She was a, a doctor. She ran a clinic for drug addicts. And uh, I think that that evolved even more into the animated series uh, or series, but multiple series. So um, 
pretty interesting character. And what I remembered mostly about her without looking up anything was that she was always uh, on Batman for his his way. She did not approve of his methods, um, but yet she did support him, um, you know, and taking care of him. All right. So um, we switch over to Alfred giving a story to Jason about, uh, you know, uh, our, the story of Jason to Tim. And this picks up from previous issues or uh, chapters. Uh, Alfred shares Alfred shares that although they didn't see Jason again after he had ran off, they heard much. I heard much about him in the news, saying that he went from boy wonder to boy barbarian. Uh, Alfred goes on to say that while Jason exercised some restraint, if his foes couldn't fight back or didn't fight back, he did not do so uh, with the Batman Rogues Gallery, like the Penguin and Man Bat. Uh, the ultimate encounter Alfred relates is was with Killer Croc, where uh, who Jason nearly killed with a machine gun. Uh, so all of these brutal acts by Jason reflected poorly on Batman and Commissioner Garden, Gordon. Um, and if Robin or if Jason wasn't stopped, the police would have have to handle it themselves. Uh, so in the next scene of Alfred's rendition of the Jason story, Batman approaches lowly criminal Sid the Squid, which is a name we all wish we had. Uh, he gives Sid gives up the information on the Joker and you would, too, if you were hanging upside down by a bat rope. Um, Sid says that uh, there's a rumor that Jason is the next uh, target for the or Jason is next targeting the Joker. Um, and then we move on to Joker and Harley, a scene where they're out robbing an amusement park to celebrate the anniversary of their first heist. I'm sorry. Maybe I should have stopped because I think there might be some. Uh, interjections there that you guys would have <laughs> uh i'm really happy to see sid the squid back uh, <laughs> it's from the episode of the man who killed batman which is definitely one of the better episodes of the original run um just a really good sort of character driven story from that something you didn't see on a lot of action cartoons back in the 90s which is sort of par for the course for batman the animated series and why i think it resonated so well um Again, I'm kind of surprised. I mean, there was uh, sort of a squid criminal back in the early 80s when they introduced Killer Croc back in the day. But I'm really surprised we haven't seen Sid the Squid make his way as just like an Easter egg or some uh. sort of slowly recurring character in the Batman books. Uh, it's such a good episode and such a good story with that character. Um, yeah, that's kind of all I had to say about that. Just really glad to see Sid the Squid in there again. Yeah, I didn't know he was a character on the animated, but I I have not watched any of that. So yeah, well that's um, that's uh that's an episode to watch. The man who killed Batman. So okay, all right, Scott. Well, I guess let's go ahead and throw this in here. It's uh, at this point in the story, I was kind of surprised by um like when they're showing you know like Jason stabbing Clock King almost through the heart, you know, and I I I remember like him hitting Harley at some point in this story. Uh, yeah. You know, she's bleeding out her mouth, you know, and that's that's again, it's a little bit uh, a little bit more ramped up than what I was expecting out of this book. So, yeah, yeah. But, but what, compared to the next issue, then that's nothing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They aren't bringing about Sanders and practices here in this book. Uh, going back to the idea of kind of jumping back and forth between the designs. They don't really do it here. I, you know, this does seem appropriate, but we do have the animated series version of Killer Croc here. And I hadn't really thought about this till now for some reason, but just kind of seeing this now, just seeing what a departure the new Batman Adventures version of Killer Croc is from this, where he's more of a scaly kind of green look. Yes. And it really brings up like, oh, there almost needs to be a story reason for a change that drastic, you know, with the yeah. character's physiology and that. Uh, and again, when you're watching the cartoon, it doesn't matter. You know, and they were years apart in between those designs and everything. Uh, but, yeah, it's just when you've got a story like this, it's kind of jumping back and forth. It kind of raises those issues, I think. And, again, it's just sort of a nitpicky fan thing. So it's not a rabbit hole really worth falling down. Well, far be it from us to be nitpicky fans, Dan. Exactly. Uh, so, oh, I, did, I didn't go back and check, but we are, you know, at this amusement park here. Is this the one from earlier in the story with Joker and his other henchmen? I don't know. I it doesn't even, really say, but you, I don't know how many amusement parks are within the vicinity of, uh, you know, uh, the storyline. But it's it's a big town, so. I, 
guess it well, it's got more. the wacky wheel. I guess I can go look and see if the name of the Ferris wheel is, is the wacky wheel. Called? Yeah, let's see. I'll, I'll, will you guys go on and I'll figure that part right. out. All right. So, like I said, they were Joker and Harley were out celebrating their first heist. Um, they the anniversary of their first heist at this amusement park. And the way Joker wants to do it uh, by robbing and shooting the place up isn't really what Harley was looking for. So she kind of had a, um, an argument with the Joker and she takes off in a storm. But she doesn't just take off. She comes back in great fashion with a bulldozer and chase Joker off the pier, which, which is one of my favorite scenes of the uh, of the ep- or of the, the chapter. Um, so this, Alfred says, is uh, the beginning of the Joker, uh, Joker and Harley's very public breakup. And um, Harley begins to destroy every piece that they had or every place they had gone uh, to together as a couple which uh, reminds me of the Birds of Prey movie, um, you know, and the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn. Um, Anyway, uh, she prepares to blow up their favorite restaurant, and Jason arrives on the scene, and a fight ensues between them. Uh, Jason brags to her about being more of her type now, which is a bad boy. In fact, he tells her they have something in common and that they want to get rid of the Joker and tries to convince her to tell him where he's at. Um, but before um, Alfred goes on to say that, but unfortunately, Joker arrives before she could say anything. Um, and he zaps Robin with a taser of some sort, knocking him out or knocking him nearly unconscious. Um, and it turns out that this was all a setup by Harley and Joker. And we end this chapter with Joker tossing flowers that he had brought to Harley, you know, for um, to, to reconcile, I guess. Um, but he kind of tosses them on Jason's, uh, semi-conscious body. And that ends this, uh, chapter 11. All right. So the wacky wheel here in this one, the, the Ferris wheel in the previous issue did not have the name wacky wheel on it. And if we're just going to, it now has a similar color scheme, but it also has a little slightly different. It was drawn slightly differently with a little bit of like the strut design. So we'll call it two different, uh, amusement parks. All right, it can't least, be obvious where Joker hides every time. Right. <laughs> uh, kind of going back to the confrontation between Jason and Harley here, uh, we see something we don't see a lot in the animated cartoons, and that's blood. Yeah. Uh, there was very little on Batman the Animated Series. There was some. Uh, Batman gets beat up and bloody in the uh, pilot on leather wings. Uh, they make note of that on the commentary of that DVD, as you know, there was they were only allowed to show so much blood apparently for the entire run of the show. Uh, so, you know, you did see some now and then, but it was very rare. And again, to just see Robin slapping a woman like that, you know, it was pretty harsh for, you know, what was essentially a kid's cartoon show back in the 90s, you know, yeah. this is all coming from. Um, this ending is a sort of... Uh, reminds me of the uh, Batman Beyond Return of the Joker... Uh, straight to DVD special years ago where we find out uh, what happened to Tim Drake later on at the hands of Joker and Harley. So it starts to mirror that a little bit here at the end. I don't think there's a direct correlation there or anything. Uh, but if you're familiar with that, it kind of definitely rings of, you know, what's happening here in this book. Right. Oh, and I want to point out, too, on the last panel here, we see where uh, after being shocked by the Joker's joy buzzer, uh, Jason's hair is starting to get the white streak in it that we'll see later. So it looks like it's the trauma from that attack that led to his Ah, changing color at the end there. So we got to talk about toy figures, right, for that that issue? Let's see. So you got Dr. Leslie Tompkins, right? Right. Okay, I guess you have Carrie. She could be a, a little action figure. <laughs> I keep, I keep thinking Car- Carrie is a Easter egg or another character, but I just I can't put together who it would be. Okay. Clock King, has he had a figure before? I don't think so, but don't hold me to that, because they did a lot of action figures. Yeah, and then, of course, you could get your Sid the Squid action oh, figure. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah, and then when they're scraping the bottom of the barrel, they can drop down to the GCPD scuba divers. Right. <laughs> well, we've also got uh, Bulldozer Harley, where she has the Groucho Marx, 
arrow through the head oh. and then the silly hat. Yeah. You could do that. There we go. I got a variant for her in the 12th one. An accessory pack. Yeah. Uh, we ready for 12 then? I think so. All Absolutely. right. So part 12. So which will also be part of issue, physical issue six. This is Red Sun Rising part four. Uh, once again, Al Burnett, Paul Dini writing, artist Ty Templeton. Uh, so at the beginning of the issue, we've got Alfred and Tim continuing their discussion about what happened to Jason Todd uh, here in the in the Bat Cave. Um, so uh, as the story continues, Jason Todd is tied up in some type of amusement park storage complex. Uh, despite being bound, you know, obviously he's at the Joker's whim here, whatever he wants to do. Uh, Jason Todd still is very defiant to the Joker. Uh, <laughs> the Joker brings in some uh, top-notch uh, medical um, experts uh, for, for some insight in Jason Todd's uh, personality, none other than one Dr. Harley Quinn. Uh, so Harley delivers a what you would probably say is a pretty accurate diagnosis for Jason Todd um, about him having daddy issues and a, a rough childhood. Uh, but you do see that whenever Harley uh, hands the clipboard over to uh, Mr. J, that it is basically just a uh, a love <laughs> note from uh, from Harley to Joker. Uh, I don't know. So anything anything here at uh, this point? Because I think at, right here we kind of get a pretty dramatic shift in the story. So no, uh, this was uh, this was my uh, I, I did uh, I enjoyed the comedy, especially what you just talked about uh, what she had on the clipboard. There wasn't any prognosis at all it was just uh, a little love you love you h h plus j yeah <laughs> cool. i uh i keep looking through here we got a lot of clowns and this sort of fun house warehouse setting uh i kept thinking there's gonna be easter eggs in here i'm not really seeing anything though uh i'm not sure if some of these clown henchmen might be based on real clowns or anything like that but nothing i saw that really you know stuck out as far as that goes as far as referencing anything. All uh, right. So, so the Joker, after receiving the diagnosis, emphasis on die, uh, determines the only way to preserve his own safety um, and the safety of other villains in the town is basically to eliminate Jason Todd from the equation. So this is occurring, this conversation is occurring as one of Joker's clown henchmen hands Joker a crowbar, which is not what I was expecting to see in this story. Uh, so Joker begins to beat Jason Todd with the crowbar, all la uh, you know, death in the family, right? Um, which I found to be kind of a surprising development. Um, right. And yeah, so they have uh, several blows uh, with the crowbar to Jason, and it gets to the point that even Harley becomes disturbed uh, by what Joker's doing, and and actually steps in between Joker and Jason Todd. And uh, Joker thinks, oh, well, Harley wants her own shot. Uh, so he's offering her uh, the crowbar, but she declares that roughing this punk up is one thing, but killing him, uh, you have to put in your own Jersey accent there. Um, <laughs> so Joker uh, continues uh, to beat uh, to beat Jason with the crowbar as uh, some of the clown henchmen are dragging Harley out of the room, out of the out of the warehouse. So I mean, you have several panels of you know whack and swinging a <laughs> swinging a hit, right? Uh, and and multiple blood shots there as well. So, um, anything you know here before we before Batman enters the enters the story? Yeah, I think it's an interesting point to bring up here that uh, Joker is saying this is in response to how Jason Todd is conducting himself. Mm -hmm. He's being sort of brutal with the villains, uh, you know, despite his crazy plans and how if he would have done this anyway. We are getting Joker saying that this is about self-preservation. He does believe that Jason Todd is going to come kill him. Mm -hmm. um, so this kind of brings up the idea of escalation and things that have come up before. And like Batman Begins, you know, in the Nolan movies, it is, you know, how much of what the bad guys are doing is in response to Batman being there. Mm -hmm. uh, this seems to be sort of in line with that where, you know, before Joker would, would kidnap robin and beat him up or something he's serious you know here about killing this guy because he thinks he will come after him yeah anything else i think that's it for right here all right so we we switch over to joker's henchman carrying harley out of the building um and then at this point batman swoops in and and rescues harley now we learn from the voiceover uh from alfred that harley actually offers to help Batman stop the Joker, but 
uh, uh, Batman probably wisely decides to leave her handcuffed outside. Uh, so Batman basically walks in on the scene of Joker standing over Jason Todd, you know, with the crowbar, crow, a crowbar, and, and uh, I lost my place here in my notes. Okay, here we go. Uh, over a very bloody Jason Todd who's still tied up. So uh, Batman, you know, makes himself known. Uh, Joker's, you know, puts six his henchmen on him and tries to get away. Well, during the course of his getaway, um, some of the helium, I assume we're supposed to think these are helium tanks at this point, um, are actually uh, shot and cause an explosion. And the explosion knocks Joker's getaway car back over on top of him. Uh, so Batman then proceeds over to Jason Todd, unties the, you know, apparently dying Jason, um, tells Batman that he has to kill the Joker for what he has done and actually hands Joker or hands, uh, hands Batman the crowbar. Um, Batman then takes the crowbar, walks over to the Joker who is still pinned underneath the car. Uh, but instead of beating Joker with it, Batman uses the crowbar to actually free the unconscious Joker from underneath the car, which upsets the now upright uh, Jason Todd. So Jason makes a move to try to actually stop Batman, but in the process knocks over some tanks, which apparently have been, you know, partially damaged uh, during what's already happened, which causes those tanks to explode. So Batman then takes the Joker out of the building, and then as he goes back in to try to rescue Jason, uh, he actually only finds a portion of the Robin uh, costume, and most notably the part that has the R on it. Uh, so anything to add before we before we move forward? Yeah, I think I think there's a lot to go over here. Um, so we are getting sort of a condensed version of sort of the big beats from Death in the Family and the death mm -hmm. of Jason Todd. Uh, again, I feel like this probably is closer to how this would have been adapted if this were an episode of the cartoon, uh, where they kind of when they did do stuff like that, they would streamline it down uh, pretty effectively. Uh, we are getting you know, an explosion, you're getting the crowbar. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're kind of tying in the themes that come up in the comics in the Under the Red Hood story and in the uh, animated DVD feature they did where Jason expects Batman to kill Joker for him, like in revenge for his death. And now again, the you know, Jason isn't dead yet, but he's, you know, on his last leg here at this point. And, you know, Batman doesn't do it. Batman doesn't kill here. He doesn't kill the Joker. Um... And, you know, we're still getting an explosion. And again, it's not, you know, we don't have the whole Middle Eastern subplot or Jason's mom that we had in Death in the Family. We don't have Superman showing up at the last second or anything like that. But I don't feel like we would have had those elements in Batman the Animated Series in the 90s. Uh, just because, you know, it's a longer story in the comics. You don't have time for all that. And, you know, what was essentially a 22 minute, you know, cartoon show every day. Uh, but again, I feel like it was handled very well. We still get a lot of the same beats. And it still kind of ends up in the same po part where, you know, Jason is dead. Um, whether or not he's really dead, dead, we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. You know, but, you know, you still get to the same point, essentially. Well, in the, of course, in the comic, he, I mean, Batman has the dead body of Jason Todd, right. who he buries. Whereas in this, we get the unknown yeah, fate right. of Jason Todd. So there is a little bit of a, a variation there. All right, so uh, so now we're back to uh, Alfred and Tim in the Batcave, and uh, Alfred tells Tim that Bruce slash Batman had, had searched for Jason for months without any success in finding him. Uh, Tim uh, fairly smartly points out the similarities between his origin story and Jason's origin story, so why would Batman take the chance of this happening uh, again? Uh, Alfred, you know, tells Tim that, you know, he has more integrity and dedication than what Jason had, uh, thus, the reason why they are actually even having uh, this particular conversation. Uh, so I thought that was a nice quality moment there for uh, for Tim. Uh, then Batman uh, enters the cave and it agrees uh, with Alfred stating that Jason was the biggest mistake of his life. And then as Batman reaches out to shake Tim's hand, Tim kind of surprisingly flips him. And of course, we learned that that is not actually uh, Batman, but Jason Todd. Uh, in the disguise of Batman. So um, Alfred and uh, Tim have a brief scuffle uh, with uh, uh, Jason Todd. And as that uh, fight ends, we see Alfred unconscious on the floor. Uh, uh, Tim is also uh, knocked out, being dragged up the staircase. 
And in one of uh, Jason's hand and the other one of Jason's hand, he has Tim's Robin costume. So that leads us to the title of the next part, which is How to Kill a Robin. So what there in that uh, closing fight scene do you guys want to talk about? Uh, I didn't see it coming. Yeah, I, I like this. I thought it was a pretty fun sequence. I like uh, Tim bringing up how his origin is similar to Jason Todd's because in the animated series, a lot of that was transposed onto his character. I feel like that's almost sort of a meta, you know, comment from the writers here, mm-hmm. you know, acknowledging that, you know, they are have similar stories because of how Tim was handled in the cartoon. Uh, yeah, I like I didn't see Jason Todd as Batman coming. I thought that was kind of a fun twist. Mm-hmm. And again, it makes sense with, you know, he knows where the Batcave is. He would know how to do this, you know, that sort of thing. So I guess the question is, is where is Batman at right now? Right. So I guess we'll find out in the next issue. <laughs> <laughs> Coming back from the clinic, apparently, because, you yeah. know, we don't know how long this flashback story in real time has lasted. This could have been two minutes of Alfred and yeah. Tim talking this whole time. That's right. So, all right. So, and then we had the advertisement for DC Fandom there at the end. <laughs> yeah. And they have the right date this time. On hey, there. yeah. Like, and it was actually before. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. And this is some of the fan art that they had in the gallery here in this ad that you can see. Um, you, you know, you could check out higher res versions of it on the site. And again, this might still be up. So, this might be something worth checking out. So uh, new figures, of course, you could have Jason Todd Batman. Yeah. Uh, crowbar beaten Jason Todd. Yeah, you got some variants in here, that's for sure. Yeah, Har- Harley Quinn in a medical coat. A Joker with crowbar. <laughs> or maybe uh, Joker with bloody crowbar. Clown goon four pack. Yeah, there you go. And Tim Drake in civilian clothes. So, <laughs> <laughs> again, that's the bottom of the barrel when the when the line has run its course. So, <laughs> uh, Joker with his car. Yeah. Yeah. So, but uh, I thought the, I I uh, liked these issues. Uh, I thought they were a step up from some of the uh, from some of the last ones. The last ones were good, but uh, I really feel like we're now we're moving towards the end, right? So, so we got one more issue. Um, yeah, well, two more parts. Yeah, what's that? Yeah, it, it'll be two more digital chapters and wrapping up. Uh, again, we'll see how this does. Um, I don't know what the future of the toy line is with, you know, DC direct supposedly not being a thing anymore. Uh, the comics have been really good though. Uh, I wouldn't mind seeing more of the comic. Yeah. For sure. Even if there's not a toy line that it's supporting. Yeah. So yeah, I, I I've enjoyed this, part of this on this. So, yeah. What's that? I, I just said I was at kind of a near mint minus on, on uh, these issues. So Mike, what were you saying? I was just going to do the same thing and grade it. Uh, I was going to give it a very fine plus. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'll go near mint with this. Uh, I, I wasn't expecting them to handle the death of Jason Todd that well. And so closely, you know, to the comic book as we ended up getting, uh, considering I don't feel like the rest of the series has gotten that close uh, to that character. So I, you know, it's kind of a fun thing and we'll see how it kind of wraps up next time. <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for this episode. I think the the dog barking is going to signal the end. Yeah, I think so. (laughs) (laughs) He thinks it's time to be done. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Mike, where can everybody find you at? Oh, at the ever trusty uh, Mike Atchison 5 Twitter. All right, Scott Reed, you can find me at bergcomics.com, B-U-R-G comics.com, and then I'll hopefully be at Campus Comics on the 26th of September. And this is Dan Brown at Detective 651 on Twitter, Instagram, and TeePublic, and at the stores most Saturdays. And again, the store is located at 816 East Main Street, Suite B in Carbondale, Illinois, uh, 618-457-6011 if you want to give us a call. And we are open Tuesday through Saturday, 11 to 6. And thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.
When we when we say your name, Dan, are we supposed to say Dan Brown? Sure. <laughs> Dan, or Dan Brown. <laughs> Something exciting. Um, I hear an echo, but I don't know whether to keep going or not. It's I don't know if it's on your end or mine. I I don't hear anything. Okay, you guys good? I hear the echo too but I'm not sure where it's coming from. So, Well, I feel like you get what you pay for with this podcast. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it recording for just a minute. I got to go. <laughs> you got to go. All right. So <laughs> uh, we'll just, uh, we'll, oh, okay. Well, we won't. I well, guess we'll text you what we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>